everyone and welcome to the 2021 PAX Oz Digital Games Indie Showcase. I am your host, Jeannie Maxwell, and can I just say how thrilled I am to be here hosting an event that is invariably my PAX highlight. Uh, it, it feels really special. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, I'd also like to extend that respect to any Indigenous person tuning into the stream tonight. Uh, this evening, I'll be speaking to six developers who each contributed to the incredible games uh, collected by this showcase, and what a range of games there are. There is a World War I uh, survival horror game, there is an incredibly wholesome and cute Indigenous-inspired fantasy co-op, there uh, is a farming sim in VR. There's really something here for everyone. And talking to these devs only made me even more excited both to play these demos and to get the full games. Uh, I hope you enjoy. To start things off, we have a game for the Minecraft and Stardew Valley fans. It's a township tale, a farming and life simulation open world RPG that's just been released on the Oculus Store. That's right. You can now farm, hunt, craft and explore in virtual reality. Today, we're joined by developer Victor Nascimento. Victor, how are you doing? I'm fine, and you? Yeah, good. Good. Uh, as we were just saying before the interview, a little allergic. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> exactly. The spring, the spring hit me hard today and it... <laughs> surviving, definitely surviving here. Yeah, one of the downsides of the significantly nicer weather. Um, <laughs> oh, I do not know about you, but I like my cold. It, it oh, helps yeah? <laughs> help keep my, my computer nice and cozy instead of overheating. So True, true. And uh, I imagine um, developing an open world MMO VR game, uh, that would be something of a consideration at times. <laughs> It, it definitely is. Everything we do, it always a lot of a lot of processing, a lot of GPU, a, a bunch of processes I do. I just do it, and I can instantly. I know it's working because I can hear my GPU fan like going like crazy, <laughs> or the CPU fan, the fan of the process, all flavors. <laughs> That's how you know the game's getting made. <laughs> exactly right. It's like it's a certainty. So a township tale is uh, your studio's, I think, debut project. So members of the team do come from uh, some AAA backgrounds. If I'm, if I'm right. Yes, exactly. We, it's definitely a over ambitious project, I would say. Right, like well, as we were talking before, this with the general advice is never start with open world, never start with MMO, but we did. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but then obviously we do have our CEO, he came from Rockstar, so we also have, we have different people on the team with different experiences, people from Nintendo, people that came from very big companies, very big projects. So we do have a lot of, uh, of advice on how to do all these things and a lot of context, and that's what definitely made it unthinkable actually possible. And and yeah, that's how we actually managed to get the game going. Yeah, I have to say, like reading the description and then reading the description alone, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is incredibly amb ambitious. And learning it was a debut, I was like, how is this? <laughs> actually, I, I started like looking up Let's Plays and things because I was like, a little part of me was like, is it possible that this game works? But it clearly, <laughs> really does. It, um, yeah. I am curious, kind of what drew you to the idea of VR development specifically for a project like this? The, I, I, joined, I, joined the, I, I personally actually joined the, pro, the project uh, right after it was decided on, but I can do this little story here where the, the two, two of the co-founders, they got the, the Vive headsets back, back in 2016. And then they just were just throwing a bunch of things together. They would have the scene, they have like basketballs and you had swords and have everything, right? Then they would just mock around. But then one of the guys got a, a hammer, had an anvil, and then he was hitting and they're like, oh, imagine if I was a blacksmith, right? But what 
what about being a blacksmith if you cannot use the things that you make, right? So now, now you make your sword and then you go fight this thing. Why do you fight this thing? So you can get more resources and then you can, oh, but if I, should I do everything by myself? No, that the idea grew there. So I joined very af right after that, like two, three months later. And then they had this prototype, very, very rough, that actually showed up back in 2016. And I was like, I saw the game and like, it just blew my mind. It completely blew my mind, like the all the possibilities, right? Because suddenly, when I'm playing the uh, any FPS or something like that, where you can just point your gun and like, oh, I need, oh, can you pick this item? It means like I point my gun at the thing and I should, I should just shoot it, right? Like play. Uh, left for that or think those kinds of game that's the only interaction you have between players yeah but then being a township tale and being able to say hey like grab this thing here is something let's go over there so you do all these things enables you to really feel like you're there and that is just completely mind-blowing for me at the time it still is a lot of time from time to time i still like forget that i am in the game and mm -hmm. that's what really get me going onto the vr scene in a sense. That was actually something that really stood out to me is uh, like the range of animations and the range of kind of movement uh, in the game. That's really incredible. And I feel, um, I mean, a huge feat in any 3D <laughs> like open <laughs> world, but yeah, particularly in this one. Uh, I'm really interested in kind of uh, how your art direction uh, and tech art sort of responded to I guess, um, either the constraints or opportunities of VR as a format? Um, it, it's a very interesting question, right? Because in, in one aspect, it's actually much easier, right? Because in, when you're doing a game that is very uh, standardized, like Dark Souls or Monster Hunter, where you have a, a lot of animations based on weapons and gear and everything, you, it's everything very time consuming. But in VR, the player just tracks the player actually, right? So like if I put my hand there, my hand, the character hand goes there. So it's pretty much just doing uh, inverse kinematics and that's all in the engineering side and the player just goes, right? So for the, the actual player, it's a much easier process. They just need to, to just organize everything to be a bit, um, bit more performant than you would expect on a, on a stand on PC. But outside of that, for them, it's like much easier because they don't need to be building massive libraries of animations. I would say we have like what a tenth of what a regular game has of animations because because of that, the the main player is not animated at all, actually. So that's much easier. Um, still, I think keeping even just like keeping the arms connected and moving relatively <laughs> realistically is. <laughs> Oh, like, oh yeah. such a range of and, no <laughs> yeah like i'm just i'm just saying it's easier on art department yeah. on engineering department it's a totally different story okay so, the real artists the real artists exactly please <laughs> um so i i want to know more about kind of the, the world itself there's like a pretty incredible range of uh, activities and things you can do and like the amount of crafting and exploration is really impressive uh, exactly how big is this? Is the world of a township tale? So currently, it is not as big as we're actually gonna get. We do have plans to fully using, making use of our uh, 4K by 4K, so four kilometers on each direction. So it would be 16 kilometers square, just on a horizontal space. But we also go downwards into uh, procedurally generated caves. And they are they are actually infinite, right? They they're just gonna be limited by precision of your computer, right? So uh, we we have players that go down to layer 200, 300, and that is we find we always find that amazing, but it is definitely a possibility. So how big it is currently? I would say we are on the like about like four four kilometers square. I would say. Mm -hmm. And but we do have some plans in the future to actually make full use of the oval world 16k and obviously having other possibilities of going on the other axis. So going deeper into the caves or going into uh, some other form of exploration. So ah, that's incredible. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, what an amazing answer. Um, the other thing that kind of really uh, I found really heartening uh, about uh, this game is like uh, it's sort of known already for having a really welcoming community. Um, <laughs> obviously, there are the occasional like item thieves. Um, it's hard to hard to avoid. <laughs> In, it's a social game, and sometimes people do antisocial things, you know. Exactly. Um, but I wonder, like, if that was something you kind of had uh, in your mind as you were as you were developing the game, how to, I guess, create that like positive sense of community. It's. I, I would say that it's something that is we were quite fortuitous to get because we were always very close to our community from the ground up. We. We're still, we we build our company uh, around Discord in a sense. So everybody in the company is in Discord. A lot of users message us and we to, do try to answer back. We can't answer back literally everyone because sometimes they can be a bit overwhelming. But we talk to everyone. We do, do read a bit of what people are talking about. We are on different, uh, different servers around the game. So different languages on different countries. More than like to monitor a big brother style thing, but more like just so we we are there to actually help those people, right? To help when they have ideas, when they have questions, when they have issues. So, and I would say that like because of that disclosedness, a lot of people actually took took up flags to help us to go around and do all these things to help the game be a better place. And I would say part of that thing where in VR you actually you actually like are more um, expressive in a sense. You do have people being very considerate about the others. Yes, there's a bunch of the bad apples, and they do happen from time to time. And there's not much we can like. It's not to say that there's not much we can do. We do try to have banning tools for our moderators. We do have a moderation team. We do try to provide for everybody. Especially now that we are on the quest, everyone can have their own server. And at that stage, it's my game with my friends or the tutorial thing that is like more spread around that anybody can join. It's hard for you to target somebody. You kind of join in and you, whoever is there is whoever is helping you. And it's very common to have a bunch of uh, more veteran players being on those servers to help new people. And that is amazing, right? Because if the first thing you have in a game is have someone helping you, you're much more likely to actually help the next person than if we're just like slam with, I don't know, like a monster face, like yeah. got to you, <laughs> right? So I think those kind of those kind of small details made so that the community is a little bit more welcoming than a lot of other games. That makes total sense. Um, so I guess my final question, uh, just before we wrap up, I wanted to know when you imagine a player uh, experiencing this game for the first time, what do you hope that they're feeling? I would say it's this sense of wonder of being in this massive world where they can explore, where they can express themselves, where can they experience new things. But it's always with this sense of wonder because it's it's definitely not realistic, but it does you everything's a little bit more physical you you don't walk around like as a ball of damage casting lightning from the sky so it's everything's a little bit more grounded at the same time that there is the little edge of uh fantastical so it really i don't know like that's how i go around right and i will hope people can go around and suddenly see like a beautiful sky or this beautiful vista or suddenly that beautiful that massive encounter with monsters or finding that amazing loot it's always this sense of wonder, I would say, it's the, the thing. Uh, Victor, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on being included <laughs> in the showcase. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Next up, we're discussing Spider Nest Games uh, Vault of the Void, a roguelike card game where you craft your deck, swapping in and out cards as you progress and perfecting the ultimate combos. Today, I'm joined by creator Josh Bruce. Josh, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh my God. Congratulations <laughs> on being part of the showcase. It's like a yeah. pretty incredible lineup, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, right on. Yeah, it's, it's um yeah, it's a big honor. So yeah, really happy that uh, when I got the news, it's um yeah, very, very cool. So thank you. Um, I, I was thinking just to start off, uh, could mm -hmm. you kind of uh, describe your game 
I guess in your own words. Yeah, okay. So I guess Vault of the Void's kind of, um, you know, roguelike, roguelike deck builders are kind of a, the big thing right now, or it seems like there's a lot of them coming out at the moment. And um, so Vault of the Void's kind of similar to that, but but different in the sense that um, I kind of wanted to approach it from, I, I come from more of a Magic the Gathering sort of background. So uh, the enjoyment of kind of building your deck and, um, and, and sort of crafting things as you go, you know, sitting down with your cards and putting something together. And that was kind of the real inspiration where uh, when it came to Vault of the Void. And so um, it kind of takes a lot of the sort of similar things that happen in the genre, like you're progressing, slowly adding cards and defeating monsters. But it also gives you the ability to completely swap in and out cards. So it's kind of has like a sideboarding uh, function, similar to something like Imagine the Gathering, where whenever you get new cards, you can add them in. And then so it allows the player to sort of tailor it all around and um and yeah it's just progress through the through the level defeating creatures with um with cards and and um until you get to the end where you fight um the big scary void <laughs> uh that that um magic the gathering uh influence i think is really palpable particularly in daily draft mode i love that you had like a few different uh different play modes i was wondering if you could kind of talk me through i guess uh your logic in, in including I guess a daily challenge, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So um, the obviously most of the um, time is spent sort of in the in the daily run. Uh, sorry, in the sort of standard run. But the thing about Vault of the Void is it, it's very. Uh, people have said, and it's true, it's very dense. Like there's a, there is a lot going on. Um, there's a purge mechanic in the game, which means that every card that you hold is essentially worth an energy. So you can actually right-click it to discard it to give you another energy to play another card, which is a really simple concept. But what happens is it means that suddenly when you're faced with your entire hand of cards, there's about 100 decisions that you have to make and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So for that very reason, runs tend to go a little bit long. And a lot of the veteran players can sort of um, do a run in about an hour, hour and 20 minutes. Um, however, it's not uncommon to have people in the Discord um, post screenshots with three, four, five hour runs um, as they kind of get their way through it, which is totally acceptable. So the daily draft for me was kind of a, okay, I want to try and distill the, the, um, the the process of what the game is but in like if you've only got sort of 40 minutes to just blast something out hey jump in a lot of the decisions are made for you the class is set um the deck is like it's like a booster pack which just opens and you just build your deck as you go and um it's just doing fights so it's just doing the um you know fighting all the monsters and stuff like that rather than like all the event rooms and it's a single floor only and it just gives players the ability to hey i've only got sort of you know 30 40 minutes but i want to thrash something around here and um you know, hooked a leaderboard up to it and um and that's it so <laughs> yeah it's a, um the people that like it really like it and they like the fact that they can just get in and, and have a go Totally. I was hoping to kind of dive a bit deeper into kind of the roguelike elements uh, of the game as well. Mm -hmm. um, is there, do you ever, is there anything you carry over between successful runs or are you, is the player always starting fresh? Yeah, so one of, that's one of the things I had to decide pretty early on. And I've been pretty public, I guess, um, with sort of my stance when it comes to sort of roguelikes and, and, and this entire genre. And that is that I actually don't really play them. And so I come from a position where I, I, I intentionally now don't play them. I don't play the, the card games or the deck builders because I want to try and approach things a little fresh. And so my perspective on it is probably a little bit different to, to other people's. Um, I know that a lot of people like that meta progression and being like slowly getting stronger and stuff like that or unlocking cards. And um, with Vault of the Void, I, the way that I went with it is um, – basically i said no meta progression whatsoever so every time you start you're starting at the same power level and there, there is some exceptions to that so each time you um play the game you'll earn sort of void points is what um what they're called <laughs> happily now i think yeah if i ever need a name i just throw void on the uh, on the start of something and it works out but um so you earn these void points and um then in the unlocks menu you can unlock deck backs um that for me, um, my background, actually my full-time job is I'm a concept artist. So I work uh, on artwork for um, video games and stuff. I freelance concept artists. So art is like the big thing for me. And um, I love the Hearthstone deck backs. And so I was like, yeah, definitely going to put these in. So there's deck backs in there that you can unlock with your void points. 
and a lot that you can unlock via achievements as well, but also backgrounds. So like the battlefield that you play on, you'll have the standard one to start with. And then after a couple of runs, you'll have enough void points to actually unlock a couple more. And there's, I think, six or seven in there at the moment with some more coming. So um, that is sort of the uh meta progression in, in a sense and then the other part to that was the mastery system and that was just kind of i call that meta light it's very um so basically what happens is there's 10 common cards for every class and every time you you win a fight you can pick one of those to master and then all it do, all it allows you to do is at the start of your next run you can add one of your mastered cards to your backpack and the backpack is essentially what i was saying with the sideboard and and the card library so there there is that meta progression but there's no card unlocks there's you know um it's very very um sort of light it's like one card to pick at the start of a run and they're only commons and they're all predetermined as well um so yeah the, like once you the, the first run that you do in vault of the void and the hundredth run you do in vault of the void with a particular class the card pool won't change whatsoever nor will the artifact pool like it's all unlocked ready to go from the start i guess uh kind of having that I guess like uh, having that sort of like constant fresh start really encourages players to uh, diversify their strategy and like play different ways as mm. well, I can imagine, which makes sense given how incredibly customizable the decks are. Uh, yeah yeah definitely and like vault of the void even even worse it makes it exasperates the problem a little bit because I, again i kind of flip things up a little bit whereas you can look at a map and every fight will tell you exactly what card you're going to get you don't get to pick three or get mm -hmm. like a booster or anything like that after a fight every hex when you mouse over it will show will show you what card you're going to get and so you Vault of the Void's sort of core ethos was like reducing RNG and throwing more um, throwing more control to the player in terms of planning, which gives a lot of, that's again, why runtime start to go out because you can look at a map and you can plan a path on a map for a good five minutes. It's, okay, yeah, I want this card, I want this card. And the way that the map movement system works is very sort of snaky and um so what can happen then is you can jump into a jump into a run and, and potentially see the same cards and then because you have the ability to just swap in and out cards the, it can like it, the worry was that oh i've seen this run before right oh i've seen this run before you know i've seen this so um there is certainly um a concern there but thankfully like that helped by sort of buffing out the card pool and stuff like that so it does make each run feel feel fresh and you're starting at an equal power level um as opposed to i can't beat this game until i've invested like 50 runs in it to unlock x y and z yeah yeah so basically it's a deck builder for blue players <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's for, it's for those that don't um that yeah that that like planning and like analyzing and um and yeah want to and maybe might want to take things um over a couple of nights because <laughs> sometimes it can it, they, a lot of people have said that sometimes they need a little nap after a run it's uh it can be a bit <laughs> exhausting <laughs> that's good though it means they're engaged yeah, that's it. Yeah, so, um, hey, if I can put people to sleep, I guess, and I'm doing something. <laughs> um, I wonder uh, if you could kind of expand on how the class system sort of uh, works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, definitely. So there's um, there's three classes in the game at the moment, um, which is the rogue, uh, I call it the rogue, the hidden, um, the enlightened, and the daughter of the void. And each of them play very, very differently. Um, in, to the point where they each have their own sort of unique sort of gimmick. So the hidden himself, um, he has combo. So he builds up these combo points. And then when you play certain cards, um, they'll trigger multiple times. Um, and he's and each class also has two specs. So <laughs> to make the problem more. So basically when you start, you can choose with the hidden, you can play bleed spec or you can play blade spec. Blade is about generating these like hidden blades and throwing them out with massive combo damage to hit things multiple times. And then bleed is your standard, what you think it is. You know, it's like a dot based mm -hmm. build. And then the, um, the enlightened was the second class and um, he has two builds as well. He's got future strike and she. Future strike you apply to an enemy and every 
uh, and then it triggers every second turn. So you're kind of hitting them in the future, you build it up and then it just um, cascades and explodes on them every two turns, uh, which is very satisfying for players when they just see it start rolling and going off. Um, and then the other one is she, which is kind of like this mind um, bending sort of power where you can, you basically build it up on an enemy and once it reaches over their current HP, they'll just explode so they just die so um each of the and each of the specs as well are set up to be able to be hybridized so you can actually if you pick the future strike start you can actually um sort of start splashing in some she and stuff like that as well so that it, it is intended to encourage um deck building and then the last one is the daughter of the void and she's like a necromancer and she's very sort of she's considered the big brain class there's a lot of discard synergy you're building up corruption very slow sort of totally build but then it turns into massive overwhelming um uh sort of power at, at the end of the day so um and each class uh, again you start with the hidden unlocked and then all you got to do is reach the end of floor one and then the second class is unlocked and then same with the third class yeah so um yeah that's 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 how they work at the moment uh and Am I right in thinking there's a, another class coming yeah. soon? <laughs> yeah, so um, actually, in fact, it was for, um, I, you know, once we sort of got the announcement regarding PAX, I sort of pulled out all the stops and um, I actually working with a, um, uh, a fellow who's been a um, player of the game now for a long time as well, sort of moved into a content creation role. So we've been um, kind of working pretty hard at that for the last month. And yeah, the Tempest is actually out on the beta branch right now. And so she's actually the fourth class but she's actually the second class. So, so um, the way that it kind of works is that the jump from the hidden to the enlightened is can be pretty overwhelming um, because the, the game does have a lot of keywords and it's, it's a very there's a lot of unique mechanics with the enlightened. People enjoy it when they get in, but as a second class, they're like, whoa, I need like a just a little step ladder here. So um, while she is the fourth class, she is designed intentionally to be right. a little bit more simpler, but sort of slots into that um, between the hidden and the enlightened. So um, yeah, she is going to be released on the sixth. Um, so kind of just just before PAX, so that it's all um, uh, it's all there for for PAX weekend and it's live and um, ready to play. So yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah, yeah, she's really cool. And her theme's really great as well. I, I really like those. So she's got like a sort of a Templar vibe, but with sort of this um, storm and elemental energy kind of applied to it as well. And um, her big thing is she just hits things really hard and she actually oh does. Yeah, so there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> exactly exactly what I want. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's just big numbers, big rage. Rage is a mechanic in the game which sort of increases the damage on your attack cards and, you know, for the hidden and then sometimes you can get 25% rage, 50% rage, but... No, she just goes right up to about 200% and it just starts whacking things really hard. So, um, yeah, she's really cool. And, um, yeah, people have been enjoying the playtest so far, so it's been really good. It's really promising. That's totally awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. Just to kind of uh, to kind of wrap everything up, mm -hmm. you talked about this game as being, like, pretty, like, a cerebral, like, very, like, big brain energy, very strategic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what... When you imagine a player uh, really getting into the game, what mm -hmm. kind of what do you want them to be feeling? Um, definitely, for Vault of the Void, it's that sort of every decision um, counts. And at the end of the day, what what was the main driving force was I wanted a player to walk away when they die eventually and uh, have lost the run knowing that, oh, I could have done this better. So Vault of the Void presents you with all the information. So on the map, uh, so when you're thrown into the map, you see all the mob rooms, you see all the cards that you're going to get from every mob. So you can plan out exactly, and even to the point where you can click on card rewards and highlight the cards that you want and it will mark it on your map. So yeah, cool, I can go that way. There's no hidden events. All the events have a unique icon and they tell you, oh, cool, that's the mime. I know that I can duplicate a card there. That's the uh, void stone smith. There's void stones in the game, which are like these gems that you socket into cards and it gives them new abilities and new powers and stuff like that. So all the events in the game are public. You know the fight before you go into it. So when you click on the mob room, oh, it's the Forsaken. I'm going to modify my deck, which you can do at any time, to tailor for this fight. I'm going to change my spell to tailor for this fight. And so Vault of the Void really is, is, is about presenting the play with as much information as I can. And then it's kind of um, 
you know, it's like I, I'm, I've given you the answers to the test. I've just jumbled them all up and I'm just kind of hoping that yeah. you can sort of unjumble them. So um, hopefully at the end of the day, it's a rewarding experience where, um, where your decisions matter and at the end you can say, yeah, I did that because I was able to. Oh, I created this cool combo, you know. Oh, these two cars work really good together, so I've put them in to, to do this and then maybe attach this void stone to it to make it more powerful. Um, so I think I think that's probably um, yeah like that that is the goal. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully it works out that way. <laughs> Josh, thanks so much for joining me, and congratulations again. I can't wait to play more of Volta the Void. Ah, thank you so much. We're joined now by Dragon Bear Studio Creative Director Paulina Sammy, who's currently developing Enchanted. Enchanted is a gorgeous couch co-op where you run a cute little inn set in fantasy Australia. But instead of set, uh, but instead of basing that fantasy world on medieval England or Europe, it's uh, inspired by indigenous cultural knowledge. Um, Paulina, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Lovely to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you. Congratulations on your inclusion in the showcase. Thank you. Uh, that's really exciting. Though I know digital showcases are a bit tricky for co-op games. Um, it's so cool seeing a game like this kind of properly celebrated. Um, I thought uh, to start off with, maybe you could kind of uh, introduce the game sort of in your own words. Sure thing. So Enchanted is a cooperative multiplayer online game where you and up to four friends uh, play together running a magical inn. Um, and that involves many things from serving magical potions, drinking magical potions and getting special powers, or making steaks, fighting monsters, feeding monsters, all sorts of things. And ultimately, uh, you are trying to serve your local customers and fight off the evil wizard, your landlord. <laughs> it's definitely a dynamic I can get behind. <laughs> um, now, I know you just released a pretty uh, stunning new trailer. Um, but I wondered if you could kind of give a little bit more background in how your game has developed over the past year in between these two PAXs, I guess. So after last year's PAX, um, which was so exciting, um, we went on a big journey and we actually were looking for publisher um, to help us take the game online and to expand our, <laughs> expand our horizons as a studio and Really, like we wanted to just push this game as best as we can. So we actually signed with Asmini Digital, which we're super excited about, and we've been working uh, quite <laughs> quite strongly behind the scenes, uh, maybe a bit quietly too, to really try and rev up the game as much as we can, include as much content as we can, and develop the art and the sound. Yeah. Awesome. And kind of to that end and to like look after the well-being of your team, you've been prioritizing that kind of development over kind of uh, maybe a standalone demo for this year's PAX. Is that right? Yes. Actually, this has been the hardest year of development we've ever had. Um, we've been isolated from each other. We can't just go into the office and hang out like we normally do. So to protect the mental health of our team. Um, yeah, we've decided not to do a demo, unfortunately, but um, that doesn't mean that uh, we're still not really excited to be here and everything. And we, ho we hope everyone will support us um, as we just quietly work in the background to just finish the game and get it out there as quick as we can. I think um, something that's like been really, <clears throat> sorry, I think something that's been really remarkable about Enchanted for as long as I've been kind of watching the development is how sort of like caring and like thoughtful your approach to, uh, you know, the design of the game, but also to like looking after your team has been. So I think, I think every, I think that's a very wise decision. And I, it's, I think comforting and uh, inspiring to see indie teams uh like making those kind of measures that are a bit more like yeah person first <laughs> thank you yeah it was a really hard decision because we really loved uh everyone playing it last year and we loved watching mm. the videos and the streams and just getting everyone's feedback so that will be sorely missed but i'm sure there'll be more exciting opportunities to play in the near future um at it, maybe when we're a little bit less in a way that's not as stressful <laughs> totally um now, getting back to the game itself, uh, another thing that I know we've spoken about before, but that, you know, a broader audience might not know is your game has uh, 
quite a lot of Indigenous game developers on staff, uh, including um, Yara Gundich game designer Phoebe Watson. Um, but you have you also have uh, you know Indigenous artists and animators. Uh, so kind of that like, uh, which is so incredible. And on top of that, uh, your team's consulted pretty extensively with local Indigenous communities. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, tell me a little bit about how that has shaped the way you designed the game. Quite heavily. Um, from the very start, we wanted to work with a whole variety of people um, and definitely try to include as many Indigenous designers and, and games um, mm -hmm. artists and mob as we could. Um, so there are a lot of values in the game that are kind of deep-seated with that. So there are, you know, environmental values in there. There is, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, fishing in the game. And mm. the way that we've designed the fishing is that, you know, you got to watch out for the endangered fish. And mm. the, the object isn't to overfish, it's to fish as sustainably as you can. So we tried to tweak, um, I guess, how the players can having fun and making sure that we captured those those important values of the community so that they would feel happy and proud and to share those values. We, we think they're important. Okay, you didn't tell me there was fishing in this game. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Wait, no. I obviously need to know everything now. You might not know this about me, but I am a fishing mini game obsessive. I love a fishing mini game. Okay, let me tell you all about it. Okay. Okay, so every day you, you run the, in during the day and then in the afternoon and then in the night you have a little bit of a breathe and you make some choices and you relax. But I felt like, you know what we all need as players? A holiday. So every so often there's these things called harvest days and you go out into the, um, the world and you harvest different things and you learn about plants and agriculture, which is really important to the community and the historical way of life. Um, so yeah, you do fishing in one of them and Kalan, one of the um, indigenous elders teaches you how to do fishing using spears and there are rainbow fish and codfish and it's, it's actually just really fun and it's just fun to play and splash around in water. <laughs> That's so gorgeous. So the game really, um, maybe unlike something like uh, a game like Overcooked, which is very much just set in that like little competitive, and this is not a no shade to Overcooked, but it's like it's set just in that little competitive space, really. Um, and moving out is similar. You can kind of, which is another Australian co-op game, you kind of move between, uh, you know, little arenas where you do the same sort of, uh, you do that same like uh, chaotic cooperative mechanic uh, in every space. But it sounds like Enchanted takes kind of a different approach. Most definitely. Um, I loved Overcooked and it was a huge inspiration. I found it too stressful though. Yeah. <laughs> and I Same. wanted to keep my friendships. <laughs> so we, we kind of designed it in the opposite way of like, yes, you can go as hard as you want and you can try and get the best score and you can be as competitive. But the game is actually designed in a way that watches how you play and adapts based on that. So if you're doing really well, it will keep continuing to challenge you if that's what it thinks you should do. Mm -hmm. Or if you're like you're having a, like a rough day and you want to just relax, it will let you relax. Um, there's some really cool, um, we call it the AI task director, which is kind of like the secret magic source behind the game that's watching how you play and giving you real time adjustments. Um, but yeah, more holistically, the, yeah, the idea is that I think that I want to create a little bit of space so that people can play the game that they want to play it and have these downtime moments to relax and chat to their friends and take it the way that they want to take it. <laughs> I feel like the world's already stressful enough with all the things going on that I don't want to stress the players more unless they want that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. I, I love that approach. I can imagine that could also make the game uh, could kind of open the game up a bit more to kind of a wider range of players as well. I really hope so. Like in all the playtesting we've done at, at PAX, at Acme, and all the places, we really love seeing families play it together and kids teaching their parents how to play it is really adorable. Um, and just, yeah, letting people, um, I guess, enjoy the experience of playing with four people and not just being overwhelmed by the, every single thing you have to do. Mm. Um, cause I think that that's ultimately why we play games, right? It's to have this beautiful experience with, particularly for co-op games with the people that you care about. 
Totally, totally. Or in the case of overcooked, totally destroy all your relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there are really strong relationships out there. They got stronger. I don't know. I mean, that's a trial by fire, though. <laughs> that's <sure>. true. <laughs> that's really cool. Kind of that more relaxed, um, that more relaxed approach seems like quite innovative and new. I don't know if I've I've seen a game like that, a co-op game, do that kind of thing before. Um, no, go on. Thank you. I, I hadn't seen it either, so I thought let's give it a go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and like, that's such a thing about this game. Like it is really, uh, it's really cute and really approachable, but it is also like quite groundbreaking. I think like there are lots of design decisions you've made that are just like, oh, I've never seen someone do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. The, the team is like so talented. So it's really exciting mm -hmm. that we get to do things like that and, um, try different things. And yeah, ultimately, um, I think that it's really important to let players play the way, the way that well, they want to play. Totally. Are there things, because I know like your vision really has evolved over time and like you've grown with the game and the game has kind of grown with you. Are there, uh, I guess, aspects of the game now that you think would have surprised Paulina of like three or four, three years ago when you were just, just starting out? I definitely, there are a lot of things, but I think the biggest one for me is um, two, I think. Um, mm. One of them is having online multiplayer so that families or friends can play across mm. the, the transatlantic or whatever mm. they want. And that connect, creating that connection across the world, I think, is something really exciting, especially in the current situation when connection is hard. So that was, that was a big thing that I'm really proud of. Um, mm. And I think the other thing is the, like, a direction that we took to really like make sure that we built a really robust uh, companion AI for single player. Um, it's really funny. A lot of a lot of the playtesters have found that they like single player more than multiplayer. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe it's because we were like, how do we design an AI that gives you the least emotional burden as possible? It will just do mm. what you say, won't ask you any questions, and I feel like that's maybe something we don't get in real life. So yeah, um, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that is something that I've loved and have been surprised by too. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, just to kind of uh, like wrap everything up, I've been asking uh, all the developers I'm interviewing the same question, the same final question, and that is when you imagine someone playing this game, what do you want them to be feeling? Wonder, immersion, um, joy, like overwhelmed mm. cuteness. I would love them to be feeling squee. Um, <laughs> I would love them to have an amazing time and I don't know, I, I would love them to, to find a little pocket of happiness and um, maybe even Zen that they can take with them after they're finished forever. Oh, what an answer. <laughs> it's always so lovely talking to you. Congratulations <laughs> you too, again. Thank for you. For being part of the showcase. Uh, and I can't wait to see more of Enchanted. You will do soon. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> Next up, I'm speaking to Ian McClarty, an award-winning experimental game developer who's currently exploring an open world in his latest game, Mars First Logistics. It's a physics simulator where you build and control little courier robots on a new outpost on Mars. Ian, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> um, just to kick things off, I was wondering if you could kind of, uh, I guess, introduce the game in your own words. Um, sure. So Mars Best Logistics is a, um, a simulation-based game about um, hauling awkwardly shaped cargo um, between various outposts on Mars um, using um, your own mechanical creations that you build with the little Lego-like components. And you have all sorts of um, sort of Lego Technic-like components like servo motors and hydraulic cylinders. And so you can um, create fairly complex little robots to, to haul cargo across Mars. Um, something that uh, kind of surprised me about the game uh, 
uh, when I was playing around with it this morning is, or the demo at least, when I was playing around with it this morning, is how funny it is. Okay. <laughs> like, I guess I was, I went in with this like really kind of uh, creative mindset. I was really interested in, you know, building and exploring. And I think my solution to the very first puzzle was to get like, uh, one of these little like hook claws and I just like poked it directly <laughs> into a hole in the center of like the block I was trying to lift um, and just <laughs> like that's, went to the next output the, of it sticking yeah, that's, in the air. That's the kind of, that's the solution, the exact solution I had in mind actually. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, yeah, I think, and like also, also the way that, sorry, did you want me to kind of no, go on, ahead. The, on the comedy of it? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's something that I've kind of come around a bit more to. Like, I think I, when I kind of conceived of the game, I thought of it as more, um, you know, more about kind of that sort of engineering and ingenuity. Um, mm. But I've noticed that a lot of people kind of react the way you did and like um, and find, and the, the sort of robots you make tend to have a lot of kind of funny personality about them. They're yeah. Kind of, <laughs> the way they kind of wobble and stuff. And, and so I've kind of embraced that. Um, a bit more now and um yeah I'm, I'm kind of all for it and i think the the you know the aesthetic of the game kind of leans into that as well it's kind of quite a playful kind of look as well um totally so um i kind of what i think of it is kind of like i don't know you know there's old lego instruction manuals with the kind of um sort of pre-primary colors everything's kind of outlined and it has this kind of like simultaneously playful um look to it but also very very functional you know you can it's very clear like where everything goes and so i really like that kind of utilitarian but also kind of playful kind of um, mix so there's a kind of engineering industriousness but then also like this kind of just wholesome kind of playfulness about it totally yeah. uh, i can actually i was going to ask you about art direction but now uh you say that it i feel like that just falls into place um that makes perfect sense uh, I love like I I love any kind of like toy manual or like anything like that. They're just gorgeous. Um, yeah, I can, can definitely see that see that influence in the yeah, in the yeah. art. And all the, I mean, Tintin was also an influence as well. Um, I, I guess like I I used to enjoy Tintin a lot growing up. So that kind of mm. um, sort of kind of flat color illustration is quite. Uh, a lot of people say it's like um, reminds me. Mobius as well, but I'm not really that familiar with Mobius. So I can't really say Mobius has any influence. Yeah. I think um, I think based on Mars First Logistics, you would enjoy Mobius's work a okay. lot. Yeah, 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 a lot. I think. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is uh, my own bias, but I think of you very much as a puzzle designer, kind of an experimental. A puzzle designer maybe forced first and foremost and mm. this uh feels like a bit of a departure from works like um jump grid uh or other kind of more like puzzly uh games you've made um yeah. and i wondered uh i guess to start with uh why the shift what what excites um, you about this world so um i, I guess the, um, I don't know if there's a particular, like, give a particular reason for the like shift necessarily. I mean, I definitely have sort of played with more free form kind of less mm. level based games, but not as a like a commercial product like this one is. Mm. Um, and, but I think I mean one of the really appealing things about this game for me working on it is the 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 process of making it is basically just making some toys and then seeing how fun they are to play with, right? So whereas like a, a level-based game like um, Dissembler or Jump Grid, mm. um, um, it, you know, you're sort of, you're sort of thinking of a, an idea for a level and then you're kind of designing that level and then, you, you know, you might come back and tweak it a bit later, but you kind of sort of, you, you it's, it's a lot, it's a very, very different kind of thought process and kind of like um, much more, sort of design centric you kind of want to make the level kind of you know evoke a certain thing or sort of make you think in a certain way 
Whereas this is much more kind of free form and open ended, and you kind of just, um, it's much kind of looser. I mean, you're still obviously trying to, you know, you're trying to put things in there that interact well together and, and kind of make make for kind of fun experiences. But like, it feels like a much more kind of open and in a lot of ways more fun experience for me because I'm kind of just yeah. part of the design is just really sort of making things and just playing with them and just seeing how they feel, you know, so. Um, yeah. Weirdly, it kind of um, uh, maybe not directly reminded me, but the game I think of yours that like I thought of uh, quite quickly when playing Mars vs Logistics was uh, Catacombs of Solaris. Oh, okay, just that's the right. way uh, <laughs> they like both games are more about uh, peaking player curiosity and creativity than than anything else, and that kind of like interest in space in literal not outer space but phys- like physical space and being in a space i don't mm, know that mm. was um yeah, yeah i think of... i mean I, I think you can definitely trace it to i mean i think probably the closest game that for me that it's related to is um, a free game i made called red desert render which is a kind of got a big open desert and, you, and it's got these sort of and you, you kind of explore the desert but then there's then there's kind of these kind of intentional glitches that you can find that kind of let you experience the space in different ways. Mm. Um, but the, the I've always been really, really interested in kind of big open spaces and, and kind of um, and kind of ways to explore them. And, and actually, the one of the, the main sort of I guess sort of driving concept behind this game that kind of um, um, kind of led me to this game was this uh, this kind of idea of how to make a landscape be like a character in the game, like, you know, and so this idea of like actually, you know, making it, it's your main adversary in the game, right? It's the landscape. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was kind of like the main kind of idea I was exploring when I got into this game. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, uh, I'd love to hear more about why you wanted to set the game on Mars, because uh, it uh, kind of seems like a particular challenge, right? The, um, the environment is your adversary, but Mars, famously, not a lot of plant life. <laughs> <Not a lot laughs> of... <laughs> uh, I think. Oh, I think one of the things that kind of appeals to me about um, the Mars, but also the fact that you're kind of doing deliveries, is it's very kind of grounded, and it's like you're kind of doing a job, and you're kind of contributing to this, you know, colony that's going up on Mars, and. And it's sort of, it, I think it just makes it feel a bit more kind of grounded. You're not like really battling space aliens. You're not, um, mm. um, you know, you're not sort of exploring like alien planets. So it kind of, it kind of, it's a bit, you know, it's something to kind of lean on. And obviously there's, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's currently a, a rover on Mars and there's been other rovers and there's, you know, there's new images coming from Mars. So it's kind of in, in the collective consciousness a bit. Mm. Um, but it's something that's sort of, you know, it's not outside of the realms of possibility. So it's kind of sort of like, I think it feels like it grounds it a bit, you know. And, and, and then that ties into the fact that you, you know, you, you're kind of doing a, a, um, a kind of a menial task of doing deliveries, you know. So it just kind yeah. of, like, I don't know, it just sort of leans into that, um, I guess, groundedness of it for me. That makes sense. Um... You sort of cited uh, Death Stranding as something of an influence uh, on the development of Mars First Logistics, um, but kind of uh, the enthusiasm maybe with which other people drew that uh, connection sort of surprised you. I was wondering if you could speak more to kind of that influence and, um, yeah, so, and I guess Stranding-like as maybe an yeah, emergent genre. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because I think... Um, I, I mean, I've definitely been thinking about, like, you know, doing something along these lines, like, you know, something where you're kind of exploring a landscape and how do you, what's a good way to kind of interact with that landscape? And, um, and, and you know, things like, um, there's, there's plenty of other games that where you do deliveries, like something like SnowRunner or Mudrunner or, or even Euro Truck Simulator, you, you're traversing these landscapes and doing deliveries. Um, but I think what was um, exciting about a couple of things I found exciting about Death Stranding was like 
the way sort of the role that physics played in like you know um you know having to balance all these things on your back and and kind of navigate this and that kind of um i mean i guess in something like snow run that plays a role as well uh, but then also like uh the way you had to plan your routes in, in, in Death Stranding. So um, there was this kind of process. You, okay, you choose this delivery and then you, you look really carefully at the map and you kind of like, you, you look where, where it's rough and you kind of navigate out a route before you set off, you know. And then there'll always be unexpected things that, like I really like that whole kind of like process of um, you know, planning your deliveries and, and then, um, and then, and then, and then um, executing them. Um, I think... I think um, I think like I think one of the things like why I was a bit surprised is like obviously there's a whole lot of other stuff in Death Stranding as well, right? Like it, there's a whole story and it's it's this very strange like universe. Um, but um, I guess I'm I, I was quite, kind of a bit surprised that people sort of think of Death Stranding as this delivery game, which I suppose <laughs> it is, but it's also so much other stuff as well, right? Um, 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 yeah, uh, and so I, I think, yeah, I think I, I kind of was, I was expecting more comparisons to things like, you know, SnowRunner or Microrunner or something like that. But yeah, um, yeah I think, uh, I think <laughs> probably because, because it's so fresh in people's mind, the strain, you know, mm. it's, it's really popular. So. It's sort of funny as well, isn't it? Like, Death Stranding, like, had this, uh, you know, surreal, complex kind of world building stuff, but so much, like, the people who love it all I hear them talking about is delivering, <laughs> like yeah, delivery. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I think yeah. it's a... <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, so. I, I think it was really kind of, um, um, I was really surprised and really like glad that that's something that had that as its core kind of thing you did in the game was so successful as well, you know. I mean, obviously oh, there's still fighting and stuff in it, but it's kind of like, it was just a... Um, um, it kind of gave me a bit more, like, made me think, oh, you know, maybe I could make a game where you just deliver things and that would also, could also, you know, be viable, right? So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's always, like, it's always exciting to me to see, like, uh, games that are genuinely a bit weird um, kind of really find their audience. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. awesome. I've been thinking yeah. that about um, Among Us as well. Like, it's this little, like, Newgrounds-looking <laughs> game. Yeah, yeah. Somehow, like, the most played one of the yeah. most played games in the world. It's cool. It took, it took them a while to find that audience, but they did eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's not, it's so funny. Yeah. Um, I was wondering um, if you felt that kind of your background with, uh, even though like, I guess, genre-wise, Mars vs. Logistics is quite different. I was wondering if you think that your background kind of with puzzle design had informed the way you approached this game, because there is still that sort of problem-solving yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, things. Yeah, I'm definitely thinking about like what what kind of um, like you know designing like different cargo to carry and sort of the constraints mm. on that. Like you know, I'd like to have cargo that you have to keep upright. For example, there's 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 a, there's a certain type of cargo which I did actually show in the stream that I did on Steam recently, which is an anti gravity device which kind of doesn't have any inertia, so you. So it will kind of float away if you don't hang on to it. Um, <laughs> but like sort of things like that that will create interesting problems for the player to have to deal with, you know. So I think, I, yeah, totally. I think that kind of um, is all informed by, you know, previous, previously grappling with those kind of problems. <laughs> Thinking about that makes that. sense. Yeah. Um, so I'm asking uh, all the devs the same final question, um, which is just... When you imagine someone picking up this game and playing it, what yeah. do you hope that they're feeling? Um, um, I, I should have a really good answer to say. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, feel, I hope they get a, like a sense of like um, their own uh, ingenuity, right? So that's one. Like, I, I want people to feel like, um, like they've kind of invented something new and even if it feels like they've kind of done it in a way that you know like um wasn't maybe what 
was intended like mm. even you saying it didn't feel like the intended way but it was but like so <laughs> like having that sense of ingenuity i think is the main thing um, um and then also like having a sense of like um yeah exploring this kind of big big kind of space and contributing like you know getting sort of that sort of like sense of doing a, a job kind of you know of like yeah. contributing to this like um kind of effort of a colony on mars i guess <laughs> yeah yeah it's interesting it's like a very solitary game in some ways like you yeah. are a very small robot in this huge expanse, but there is this kind of pro-social uh, atmosphere, like a sense yeah, of a community, yeah. even if that community is Yeah, not like you're abstract. not sort of battling competing companies or anything yeah. like that. You're sort of just, you know, you're, yeah, you, you're, your you're a cog in the, in the kind of a big wheel, but hopefully yeah. like you're, you know, you're, you're doing an interesting job. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Ian, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the game looks amazing. I can't thanks. wait to pick up a lot more oddly shaped things and <laughs> carry them over <laughs> distance. Um, yeah, uh, congratulations again on being included in the showcase. Thanks, Jean. Next up, I'm speaking to Jordan Mockey, the solo developer of Conscript, a survival horror game set during the Battle of Verdun during World War One. Jordan, how are you going? I'm doing very well and happy to be here. And thanks for having me. Ah, congratulations on earning it. Your game looks incredible. Um, it's like a real testament, I think, to like the range that this showcase has. Um, it's a really exciting looking title. Um, and maybe to yeah. start off with, I wondered if you could kind of introduce uh, the game in your own words. Yeah, sure. So Conscript is essentially a survival horror game set during World War One. It's really that simple i'm kind of lucky to have the have like an elevator pitch that's that simple <laughs> it's just what it says on the tin <laughs> yeah literally literally yeah 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 i mean that makes sense um and you've been developing this game on your own for a few years now is that right yeah yeah, yeah. um um the dates are a bit blurry now because it's just been so <laughs> roughly uh three to four years and you know a lot of that was like because I've, I've never actually done game development before this. this is my first project so a lot of that a lot of the first year was just fumbling around and learning and making mistakes and and all that kind of stuff so it's kind of hard to like pinpoint when production kind of began because mm. um, it was just a lot of mucking around and, and making mistakes but the whole process has been yeah like four years roughly now so well, uh, I've interviewed quite a lot of game developers uh, at this point, and from what I can tell, 99% of game development is mucking around and making mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to even... <laughs> like, you're right. It's, it's, I guess people who play games don't really... And it's not their job to really understand at the end of the day, but it's a lot of mistake making. That's like Absolutely. all that's like, I feel like the past four years for me has just been mistake after mistake, but somehow this thing has popped up on the <laughs> other end of it. And yeah, it's crazy. And what a thing it is. Um, I was actually really interested in the historical setting of this game. Um, we were talking a little bit before uh, this interview about the fact that um, the First World War is actually really overlooked in historical games. Um, where World War Two, you know, there's a Call of Duty. It's like there's a Call of Duty title uh, set during World War Two, Battlefield Five. There are lots of games kind of across genre that explore that time period. Um, but what drew you to World War One instead? Yeah, I mean, you are right. It's so it's World War Two is always the default for some reason. And like I, I, I love history, and like I have a history degree, and. I'm interested in, in all wars really, but I just felt that, um, I don't know, something about World War I, it was just kind of uniquely brutal. <laughs> I mean, all wars terrible, obviously that goes without saying, mm. but World War I was kind of, yeah, very, just a lot of disease, a lot of death. It was kind of the advent of the modern weapons and no one really had any idea what they were capable of. And that's kind of why it was so horrific. And I just kind of felt like this is perfect for a for a horror setting because you don't really have to make anything up. Like 
the horror is there. You just kind of have to study it. You don't have to kind of even be that creative, really, which is a weird thing to say, but, you know. I can imagine that, uh, you know, there was so much technological innovation between World Wars One and Two. I imagine the kind of relative um, simplicity of what, like, people were kind of working with also really uh, lent itself well to specifically the survival horror mm. genre. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Because weapons were also, yeah, they were modern, but they were still kind of primitive compared to what would come later. Mm. And that is kind of, that lends itself well to survival horror because you kind of want weapons to be a bit clunky and you don't always want to like be able to rely on them to completely just destroy everything. So yeah, yeah, it, it just plays so well with some survival horror, uh, I found. Mm. So lucky that I chose that setting because yeah. <laughs> I'm actually really interested, um, you know, which came first, the setting or the genre, when you were kind of right mm. at the beginning of development? Good question. Um, I was fairly set on making a survival horror game at the time. For some reason, uh, it just kind of coincided that I was on a bit of a survival horror, like, binge at the time. And one thing that I really love about survival horror is just how... I guess pur purposeful everything is like just every aspect of, of like say classic Resident Evil games or Silent Hill is so like, I don't know what the word is. Yeah. Purposefully designed. It's like mm. really intricate and that's kind of what drew me to it. Um, and then, yeah, I knew I wanted to put like a historical spin on it, but I couldn't really uh, be set on a, on a, on a setting. And so, yeah, I thought about World War II. I thought about all these other events and I just settled on, World War One. It was actually originally going to have like a lot of different settings, like World War One, two, a whole bunch of wars, and it was going to be like a time travel thing. And but that's way too out of scope, you know, classic indie developer type stuff where you just want to do everything at once. But eventually, it had to kind of rein it back and really stick with World War One. Yeah, I mean that sounds like a very smart move in terms of scope, but also you know the game has. I've only played like a bit of the demo, but already you know the kind of atmosphere feels so like oppressive and consistent mm. like it really does um it fits <laughs> it, it yeah, makes sense 100%. I think. yeah for sure yeah um so you mentioned resident evil as a design influence how would you pitch conscript to a resident evil fan well um it's it shares so many similarities with, with the original resident evils from a lot of different perspectives even though the game takes place in a trench, um, it's kind of a subtle thing, but the level design is actually very, very similar to Resident Evil 1 and 2, the mansion and the uh, police station. Um, and it's got all those classic kind of tropes, I suppose you'd call them, you know, item boxes, uh, inventory management, limited resources, limited ammo, files, notes, everyone's leaving letters around <laughs> yeah. you know, explaining what happened. Although, to be fair, in, in the First World War, it actually kind of makes sense because soldiers did write letters. So, um, yeah, it's got, it's got all that stuff, all the, all the classic tropes you, you could expect. But I, I do also want to put my own spin on things. And mm. I want to I acknowledge those games and, and take inspiration from them. But I also want people to look back on Conscript and think that, like, wow, that was really unique. and something that yeah borrowed from those games but it kind of created its own path and its own identity along the way absolutely um i'd love to hear a little bit more about your kind of research process and the balance between um fiction and non-fiction i guess in making a game set in a historical setting how much of it did you make up is it really like is there a lot of fidelity to the period yeah so i mean it is a fictional story at the end of the day it's like set uh, or based upon the First World War. I didn't like really take inspiration from like a specific person in terms of like the protagonist and his, and his kind of journey. But a, a lot of research does go into it. And um, mm. luckily I did a lot of that in uni. So it <laughs> hasn't, hasn't been uh, too challenging to, to, to kind of do that. But looking back, I am kind of grateful that I, that I I'll put it this way. I have some regrets of, of pursuing a history degree because it's useless, you know, <laughs> as they say. But now that things have worked out this way, I'm grateful that I was able to do that and kind of have those research skills because it's kind of expedited the process now that I'm actually 
making this game, making this historic game. Um, but that's kind of a side t- tangent. Um, but in terms of the balance between, you know, historical accuracy and, and, and gameplay and all that, it is, it is a hard thing to manage. And I kind of have a lot of internal debates with myself sometimes, um, choosing whether to sacrifice, uh, you know, gameplay or history or vice versa. Um, and the answer is I'll always make concessions for the gameplay because it is a game and people are playing it and like, it's got to be fun. And it's, it's based on it. It's based on a historical event. It isn't a simulation. Um, but I do want to make sure that I, that I research everything. I don't want anything to be like crazy there that you wouldn't find. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Hopefully that answers. I think that was a bit of a tangent, but (laughs) no, no, I think that's a perfect answer. Yeah. Um, are you worried about, you know, maybe war buffs playing it and picking it apart? <laughs> it's a bit already or... happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, tell me everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, it's, where do I start? Where do I start? The, the, big, the big one that I get a lot is like big gun buffs who are really into like the historical guns and this gun only fires this certain way and this gun uses this kind of uh, ammunition. I remember once, because when you shoot a gun, uh, you know, the shell comes out and it'll drop on the ground and then sound. And someone's like, no, that shotgun shell wouldn't have made that sound when it hit that surface. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I got so much to worry about. Like, you know, I've got so many things I'm trying to balance. Like, this is the least of my concerns. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty funny. But a lot, a lot of things like that. But, um, I do try and, I guess one example would be, I, so there's a shotgun in the game, right? You find a shotgun pretty early on and that shotgun wouldn't have actually been uh, in that battle at that time if you're going by the history books. So I kind of, what I did was, because it, it was an American shotgun, so what I did was I put a corpse of an American volunteer next to the shotgun, so, which would have hypothetically been possible, mm. probably unlikely, but might have happened. So I put that corpse there next to the shotgun so that I knew someone would pick up that this wasn't a French shotgun and they would start complaining to me. So I was like, no, I'm going to put that corpse <laughs> there. So you can't say anything to me and that's it. And yeah, so I'm trying, I'm trying to, yeah, so I'm trying to do little things like that to kind of stop people from harassing me. Oh my God. Wise. Oh, game development. What a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. Have you had any feedback that kind of surprised you? Was the shotgun shell sound criticism like high on the list? Um, yeah, that, that was pretty high. Um, <laughs> that, that's been solved. So I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, yeah, I get, I get a lot of criticism. Um, and I'm, and I'm open to it, um, in all aspects of the game, like gameplay, you know, historical, uh, accuracy. You know, I, I listen to everything because after a certain amount of time, when you are working on something for so long, like three or four years, you just become numb to everything and it's really hard to kind of look at your work objectively so I'm, I'm fairly open when it comes to like whether it's a gameplay concern or you know whatever I'll, I'll listen to it and i'll definitely take it into account so yeah enough but you can't action at all and yeah that's true should you. <laughs> that is very yeah. true yeah I, i've learned that there's like you know when when you're looking at all the criticism you get there's like some you look at and that, mm-hmm. that you should value and then there's definitely some that you should just pretend you never saw and like Absolutely. just terrible terrible advice i think sometimes criticism can be useful when you really disagree with it because it helps you like remember that you actually know what you're doing like yeah exactly you, like make exactly. a suggestion that's so off base and you're yes. like oh hang yeah. on no absolutely no way <laughs> yeah that's a, that's exactly right i, I was actually like, I thought about that before yeah that's true um all right i'm asking all the developers the same final question mm-hmm. uh, and that is uh, when you think of someone playing your game, uh, what are you hoping that they will feel? Hmm. I want them to feel like, kind of like I said before, something, I want them to feel like they're playing something familiar, but also very, very unique. Um, mm. And that's, that sounds contradictory, but I have had people say that before, and that's like the highest compliment that I can get. Um, in my opinion, because it just kind of reaffirms what I'm trying to do with this game, which is like, look, look to the past, you know, both thematically and gameplay wise, Mm. but also just create something new that, you know, hopefully 
I can do for the rest. If this is successful enough, hopefully I can do this for the rest of my life, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, I think this is a pretty incredible start. I Thank you. can't believe that this is your first game. That's Thank you. a massive achievement. Um, thanks so much for talking to me today. Uh, the new Conscript demo, uh, demo looks amazing. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure everyone's going to love it. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm speaking now with narrative game designer Mel Taylor, whose beautiful game Blueberry is currently part of the showcase. Developed with the team at Mellow Games, this title is a tender, emotive look at memory processing through the genre of a narrative platformer. Mel, uh, it's so great to have you here today. How are you going? Good. Thanks for having me. Ah, just congratulations on uh, being part of the showcase. Um, Thank you. It's, uh, it's gorgeous to see such a range of games kind of included. And uh, yours really like spoke to me immediately um, as a lover of narrative games in particular. Um, I wondered if, uh, just to start with, you could kind of introduce uh, the game Blueberry in your own words. Blueberry is, uh, it's basically a journey through a woman's mind from birth to death. So you start out as a little child, then you're a teenager, then an adult, and towards the end of the game, you're an elderly lady. And um, it's sort of, so you control a ca character called Blueberry, who's not like not the player, but she's like a, a separate character. And you basically go through her memories and um, sort of, yeah, like you play little scenes from her life and their little mini games. And at the same time, you climb a tower, which is like a symbol for her psyche. Like you climb the tower from bottom to top and the higher you climb, the older you get. And on your way up, you find these little doors that lead to the mini games or the memory scenes. And for each game, mini game, you get a puzzle piece and you basically assemble this puzzle. That's the meta goal of the game. And then at some point you notice that there are some puzzle pieces missing and uh, you will be able to sort of return to a lower level of the tower at some point and then be able to collect these missing memories. And so that's the, the theme of sort of processing things and uh, also for her processing trauma and the player sort of helping her get over that. So I'm, I'm always curious with uh, games that are by either, you know, um, debut games from new studios or games that are clearly like uh, have, you know, personal or emotional significance to the developers. Um, how did the, your journey with Blueberry begin? What was, how did development kind of begin? Um, so I'm originally from Germany and I moved here, um, yeah, about three and a half years ago. And um, before that, I was with a team called Osmotic Studios in Hamburg in Germany. And uh, we made Orwell, which is a data spy thriller that came out in 2016. And that was pretty successful for us as a small team. And then I um, went to Australia and started Mellow Games. And um, after making Orwell, which was like my, my first indie game at all and i was um coming from uni and uh, was pretty inexperienced and uh like we we even made a sequel to it and it worked out pretty well um yeah then i wanted to sort of start my own thing and also make something that is a bit more personal and uh like something that i personally want to make and can relate to a lot and so then i started making blueberry after the experience of kind of, uh, so you've shipped a few commercial titles before, you clearly have a lot of game design, game development experience under your belt. Um, but how does that experience differ when you are working, um, I guess, with more like personal subject matter? How does it feel kind of making, I guess, personal art for a, a public audience? It's, I think, it's scary on the one hand. So I, for me, I began with, okay, I want to make something that is um, that I can relate to that is personal in a way, but I don't really want to talk about myself. And the longer I worked on the game, the more I felt like it had to do a lot with myself and like I should maybe also admit to myself that <laughs> there, there is part of me in the game and part of my personal story. 
and um, part of me processing stuff, but also I, I wanted to still keep it like as a separate thing because uh, one, I like, I'm not interested in just, I don't know, talking about me and my life story. And on the other hand, it's also still supposed to be a commercial product. Um, but also I wanted to make heartfelt art and I want people to be able to relate to that. And I also want um, people to um, be able to, like pe people who also deal with things like that, um, I want to tell them you're not alone and that, yeah, I guess have a, kind of a sense of, of understanding and um, relatability. And that's what I'm yeah. hoping um, that the game will, will resonate with people in this way as well. Absolutely. And I think um, kind of to that goal of creating that sense of, I guess, uh, connection and um, maybe even a little bit of community, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are. You know, this is a piece of personal art, but it's specifically a piece of interactive personal art. It's, you know, a video game. Um, I wonder what you think uh, kind of, I guess, the medium of a video game can offer to these kind of actually quite complex emotional topics. Um, so I think that's actually the, the heart of what I love about games in general. And I think that is a super interesting question and <laughs> totally what I want to do with Blueberry. Like, um, uh, there's a big question in narrative design, or like, I think that was a few years ago when there was a debate about uh, how sort of the player, should the player be the character, the main character in the game, or should the there be that be so should this character that you're controlling be a separate character and blueberry is very much a separate character from the player so sometimes you might even think okay this character that i'm controlling is behaving like an idiot or <laughs> i don't yeah. understand this or whatever but on the other hand um it, she's a very flawed character so when she's a kid it's it's kind of a sort of okay the world is okay is fine and everything's great um kind of style and playfulness and adventure but then when she's a teenager it gets very dark and she's also a very angry teenager and then you have like fights with her mom and her mom is kind of mean as well and then you or you're like at a party and then you have to deal with social anxiety and stuff like that um and then when she's an adult it sort of um changes again and you get like, just like your mom had to deal with you when you were a kid, you have to now deal with your own child. And the idea is sort of showing this personality and how this this person changes over the years as well to the player and to be able to say, okay, well, I guess she was kind of shitty then or she messed up then, but that's how people are. And maybe that's how what I did when I was 13 or whatever. <laughs> and um, Absolutely. yeah, I, I think like this relatability is, is very important to me. And also, I think I'm also fascinated by mundane stuff. So the scenes of her life can be super like mundane, like like I mentioned this party. And also like when you're a kid, you just want to steal the cookies and play Floor is Lava and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think that games definitely are really amazing to create empathy. Mm. Um, and like, because you have to make choices that influence this character, um, and the premise is sort of, you help her through this journey and through this, um, difficulty that she has and, uh, yeah, take her by the hand and sort of go through with her, hopefully. Absolutely. And I think kind of the massive span of time that the game covers, like really helps create that sense of empathy as well. Um, you get perspectives, even if you're annoyed with her as, you know, a, a fiery teenager, shall we say, you, then you, you've seen her as a kid, you see her as an adult, you, you don't just get one fixed perspective on who she is. Yeah, right. And also another thing that happens is um, you get these memory links sometimes for the puzzle and then you're able to sort of go back to memories that you've already played. And they're then in a sort of sepia color. And then you get different contexts of the same scene that you already played. So, for example, um, in the child phase, there are some scenes where there are new areas that you can go to um, that you haven't been able to explore before. So the memory sort of gets a different context. And then the 
story kind of changes or also like her mom talks a lot on the phone when she's a kid and she doesn't really understand what her mom is saying and then when you're a teenager and go back to this scene you will be able to read the the speech bubbles and then you will understand what she's actually saying and that's also kind of the context um that changes as you age like maybe being more understanding also mm. with uh, what your parents went through when when you were a kid because you can't realize that when you're a child and um yeah that's sort of what happens also when when you grow up and have your own child and so i guess what i'm also trying to say is you you are not just one person but you are a lot of people and the same with blueberry she sort of changes a lot uh when she goes through life and Absolutely. I can be good yeah i love that like not only does you, do you get this sort of nuanced perspective on blueberry but you also watch her perspective on her mother become more nuanced at the same time <laughs> um yeah and so often also with these these things that are that happen in your life that might be sort of traumatizing uh, I guess the thing is there's not like one villain <laughs> often or most of the times but um instead it's like a lot of bad circumstances uh, and that's definitely what it's like in this story and um also like if you have a complicated relationship with your parents most people want to love their parents and yeah. and she's sort of like okay my mom was super shitty i just want to i don't want her to be my mom anymore at some point but then she's also like well she was going through difficult things and uh i'm also a mom now and i'm also going through difficult things so it's it's really um yeah like you you also don't want to have like one parent just be the evil person because you need your parents often <laughs> so it's really complicated and i i just uh, thought it would be super interesting to sort of zoom in on on this uh these massively complicated things that can um be difficult in life absolutely um so we've focused quite a bit on the like narrative uh, and kind of emotional resonance of the game uh it does have also these really like fun and well-designed like platforming sections, right? Um, and that's kind of one of the ways you've explored uh, her, like Blueberry's uh, life over a period of time as she moves through this tower. Um, I wondered what kind of uh, appealed to you about like the kind of more of a like uh, platformer a genre as a way to tell this story or as part of telling this story um yeah so i definitely wanted to do those mini games to sort of have like gameplay that's um related to the story and is practically different um for every little game that you play um but i also wanted the player to sort of have time to spend with this character outside this um very sort of fixed gameplay and also to sort of experience her moods and i thought that the platforming would be um good for that because uh like you can really set the atmosphere and you can give the player a bit more freedom to jump around and explore and um um yeah sort of spend time so the idea is the tower is in, inside of her mind and it's sort of um there are a lot of things that just symbolize what she feels like like in the teenager phase there's a storm and it's like a lot darker than the child phase and the music um resonates with that and the gameplay is like she's the character is also just taller so the jumps feel different every time mm -hmm. and uh, so it's kind of interesting to um get in her shoes not only in the gameplay sense like making choices but also sort of physically and um yeah soaking in the atmosphere so i thought that would be interesting yeah absolutely and i think it kind of um creates this real sense of uh embodiment as well it's very yeah as you say the jumps feel different um at different ages things yeah it's i think it's very very effective uh tool um so i'm asking all the developers the same final question um and that is uh, when you imagine someone playing this game, 
What do you want them to be feeling in that moment? So I'm, I'm hoping that it would give like people who might go through similar things or not even just sort of be severely traumatized, but even if you just have a complicated relationship with your parents, or maybe you just don't know what to do with your life or where your life is going or who you are. Uh, so if, if you're, if you can resonate with that, that um, the game sort of takes you on this journey and tells you you are not alone and it can get better basically it can be okay and it's not supposed to sugarcoat it in any way but also um not be too depressing <laughs> so yeah. that's the sort of fine line we're walking with that because um there are some pretty dark scenes and um so i don't just want to make the player sad i want want to give people hope and on the other hand um people who don't really know a lot about maybe mental health or um, like dealing with things like that to be a bit more empathetic uh, of people who do and sort mm -hmm. of um, create awareness for that. And because if you see like a whole life um, and what they've been going through in detail, it's different from, I don't know if you read an article about someone uh, because usually you only know the end result of whatever happened to them or I don't know, read their Facebook posts <laughs> and you don't know what they're going through in a lot of detail. And so, um, yeah, I, that's sort of what I'm hoping to achieve with the game. Absolutely. Um, and what a beautiful game it is. Uh, congratulations again on inclusion in the Thank showcase. You. It's so well deserved. Uh, and I can't wait uh, to play the game in full. Thank you so much.